morning, everyone. So uh, welcome to the third day, to the third day of uh, the VPH Summer School. And it's my great pleasure and honor to uh, welcome uh, Professor Ralph Muller from uh, ETH Zurich. So um, Ralph has an impressive CV, uh, has an impressive number of, of publications of very high impact. And, um, and the reason is because uh, I think he has been pioneer in, uh, in many aspects in biology and, and in mechanobiology. And uh, so he has been one of, of the first to couple uh, micro CT with biomechanical studies. And then uh, his research so, uh, has evolved uh, exploiting uh, different bioimaging modalities. And um, very recently has also uh, started to, um, to dig into the field of uh, what is called mechanogenomics. Um, I, I don't know if it's a word, Ralph, that you have coined yourself or not. Um, so um, by sizing, uh, by exploiting uh, um, Chris Casper uh, techniques and, and biomechanical studies of, uh, of bone metabolic, uh, metabolic disorders and, and bone regulation. So um, accordingly, Ruff has received a, a large number of uh, prestigious uh, awards, uh, both very competitive funding like uh, European uh, Council, um, Research Council uh, award, and uh, a lot of uh, recognition from um, <clears throat> well-recognized international society. So now, Ralph, um, I will stop and uh, I will give you the floor. Thank you for the kind introduction, Jerome. It's a real pleasure to be here um, with you. Um, and uh, we'll certainly you know, um, have a time now to go through my presentation, which is you know, trying to really be motivational. I, I, will, I will not cover all the technical details. I just have to imagine that it actually takes a lot of engineering as well to actually get to what I will show you. Um, but the focus should be on what can we do once we have these technologies available and really merging different you know, fields and uh, you know, really have a confluence actually of uh, technology that uh, can maybe target, you know, uh, ideas on how is bone adaptation regeneration uh, regulated uh, mechanically and uh, find uh, omics approaches that uh, support them uh, this. So that, that's basically the, the part behind it. And uh, certainly, you know, uh, at the end, uh, I, I'd love to see you guys. So, you know, when you are at home and uh, now watching and uh, having your coffee at the same time, be ready at the end, right? That maybe we can join each other and I can see to whom I talked to eventually. So we'll have some cameras on hopefully. I'm not sure I um, do that the way the organizers want it, but certainly I'd love, love to talk to you, love to see you um, because that's probably everything we've been missing over the last months that we've always been somehow on an isolated screen and I just see myself and I watch me talking. And that helps too, actually, to keep the focus. But let's get going and, and, and do some research here and more like showing some of the aspects. So as we are a, a, a general uh, audience, um, I, I need to talk a, a little bit about uh, bone first as a living organ. So not, uh, not everybody is doing bone research, obviously. This is uh, about doing kind of in silica work. Um, and um, I think this is uh, important. Of course, you dedicate uh, to the human. So I also motivate a lot of my work, of course, by humans, but we use uh, animals often. So, but let's start uh, with bone and just to get some basics um, for the ones that haven't really uh, studied bone uh, before. And it's very important to know that bone is able to adapt its internal microarchitecture by basically three types of cells that are very important. There's more, uh, but um, these are the important ones that we can you know, say that they're able to form bone, which is the osteoblast. And there's also um, cells called osteoclasts that are able to resorb bone. And then there is uh, the cells that are uh, kind of embedded uh, in the matrix, in the mineralized tissue, 
um, that are mechanosensitive, they call called osteocytes. And if you, if you look at the screen, you see we have a femur here, and uh, you can see there's a, a lot of this spongy, trabecular, cancellous bone, as we call it, and then there's cortical bone. And, um, you know, although the, about 80% of the mass of bone is uh, cortical, 80% uh, of metabolism actually is going on to back bone. So we will see in the, in the presentation, I'll focus a lot about this very active metabolic uh, part. This is also where you would have uh, bone uh, hematopoiesis happening, right? So generation of red blood cells in, in younger age. So it's also happening in this kind of marrow field space. Uh, in the tobacco bone. And uh, these osteocytes are, uh, you know, inside, you know, what you can see here is a bone structure, right? So they're very tiny, of course. Um, these are structures uh, on the level, a couple of hundred microns maybe in, in terms of thickness. And uh, we'll see more about that. And in mouse, of course, that thing is smaller. And I will talk a lot about the mouse today, actually, as a model for uh, human um, health, but also disease and, you know, Kind of, so we're using this model, of course, for uh, kind of emulating certain things that are hopefully all working in other mammalian systems. So the interplay of these um, free cell types is called uh, remodeling. And, and so this is just a snapshot. It's not really a, a simulation. It's, it's really just animation. So it's been drawn by hand, let's say, and, and then kind of animated. And it just gives you the concept a little bit of what can happen in a, in a healthy homeostatic bone. So you will have some tubercular bone here. Um, it might be from the femur, it might be from another site uh, in the body because they vary actually. And you can see how the osteoclasts, you know, that are uh, digging holes inside. So they, they do actually, you know, kind of almost penetrate to some extent, of course, this directly, and um, there's a mechanism that this shouldn't happen. And, and then they actually refill these spaces with uh, osteoblastic uh, you know, following. So this is what happens in, in, in humans. There's a lot of coupling in that sense as well, that you know you, you would make have first a hole and then, and then you refill it in, in homeostatic form. But um, this is not the only story. So um, there's, of course, a different mechanism than in disease. So, um, and, and that's, uh, we'll go into that a little bit and how this looks like. Uh, what it does, this bone remodeling is to allow adaptation to no, new load conditions. So if I would actually change the loading here, then the bone is able to adapt to that. You know, like you change the orientation of the loading, for example, then um, this is allowing you to adapt to that. Um, you are doing um, exercise, uh, strenuous work, um, and we'll get to that, what that means. Um, you, you could obviously also adapt uh, this bone. Um, what also happens when you are working with your bones, uh, they actually uh, break uh, all the time. So you're creating something called micro cracks. Um, they're very small. So they will be just, uh, let's say here, in a small uh, region where you would um, um, you know, basically have a crack, right? And disconnecting, and this needs to be healed. And this happens all the time. It's a normal process. And, and actually, the bone remodeling allows you to uh, renew old bone material, for example, crack material or otherwise old, you know, like how you mineralize, let's say, over, over time. Because bone uh, has an old age, so it can be, you know, um, living in the same situation for, for many years. Uh, there are some bones uh, in the hearing. They, they, get, they do not get remodeled. It's too dangerous to remodel them. Um, and they are you know, formed and, and then they stay there actually for, for you know, 80, 90 years. So um, this can happen. But in normal cases, this kind of scenario where we can see, right, then it's almost all the bone actually gets uh, remodeled. And this turnover uh, is about three years, right? So every three years, you have a completely new skeleton in your body. So, so none of your bones, they look the same, they feel the same, you can do the same movement, but actually underneath, uh, it's not the same at all. And this, this plasticity is, is not something that you see uh, to that extent, actually, um, in other tissues, uh, to, let's say the brain or something like that, right? So these neurons stay for a, a lot longer once they're generated. There is plasticity, there is some regeneration. Um, but uh, certainly not to the level of uh, bone. And um, we're not going to go into the reason why this is, but certainly it has to do that it is a self-healing system, right? So you have overloads all the time. This creates, you know, cracks. You need to remodel. Okay, so the remodeling is really key to everything. And so the failure of remodeling, though, then leads to 
diseases such as osteoporosis and these associated fractures. And, and this is kind of our main motivation. Um, and lately, we've been very interested in the aging process that maybe leads to osteoporosis, but the osteoporosis will be, you know, basically the disease that causes fracture. So you have lost as much bone so that you don't can load anymore um, the bones uh, sufficiently in normal situation, minimal trauma, and you break your bone, right? So this is something that is quite a devastating thing. 50% of the women uh, are affected that by the age of, uh, you know, in, in their lifetime. And so they will experience an osteoporotic fracture. Um, at the age of 80, if you have a hip fracture, um, it's actually up to, uh, up to 90% of the people actually are dying uh, in a couple of months following a hip fracture. So it is not just that, oh, it's uncomfortable. Actually, it's a killer as well, you know, in the very old people. So we're very interested to see why, you know, these old people, you have this problem. They, they do not have uh, just the fracture. They, they will have comorbidities. So they, they will have other things. They might be diabetic. They might be, um, they might be uh, other trauma, you know, all, all kinds of things that they could happen to them. So, so but the, the, this large uh, trauma actually can uh, really be devastating for uh, those people. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, not only uh, death, but also uh, not being able to participate anymore in normal social function is actually also something that's very important, of course. And you can see already, you know, like, let's say in, in the age of, you know, women with going into menopause, and of course, then you have this uh, cycling on because it's very estrogen dependent, of course, the bone uh, remodeling. Okay. So it's just uh, something that we have to do. And just to give you a little bit of, uh, you know, work that also we have uh, done uh, quite some time ago and uh, published more like a conceptual paper as well uh, in 2014 already, uh, where you can see that they would take a real piece of bone and we do something called image guided failure assessment, which allows you to compress the piece of bone experimentally. This is so it's not a simulation, this is experimental work. So we do multiple images, right, on each step of the compression, and we can see how bone is failing. And if you look at the left side, this will be a piece of uh, you know, healthy, normal bone. And, uh, you know, you, you would actually have a very classical failure behavior. And um, you can see that a little bit. This is a, a eight millimeter diameter biopsy that has not been cut in half, right? Um, you know, longitudinally in that sense. So it's actually, you know, twice as deep, let's put it this way, just to see a little bit the internal structure. It should be cut, so not experimentally cut. And then you can look inside. And what you can see is that the bone is failing like in this area up here. <clears throat> and um, uh, this is, uh, this, you can see the blue in the background. So this is a little bit more porous. And as you would uh, predict, you know, this, this bone is actually breaking in the weakest uh, link of the chain kind of approach, uh, right? Just, just lower density here and the bone will break there. So very, very focal um, and, you know, it's overloading and it, you know, and that's actually, you know, okay, because then uh, you have this uh, failure and you can see it's not really falling apart. It's just like, you know, it has been like cracks and I'll show that later. Um, but um, um, it's of course something that is quite focal. So then the cells can actually heal this in a, in a good way. If you look at an osteoporotic bone, you can see failure is happening everywhere, right? So this is, uh, you know, a lot of buckling going on there. And uh, you can see also tensile forces, for example, this structure, See very nicely how it's kind of stretched, even though you have compression. So a lot of different modes of mechanics actually happening. And for the cells, it's a it's a mess, right? So because they get signals that oh, the bone is broken everywhere, and when they start, and so they have actually really problem of capacity. And also because the stem cells are, you know, their capacity is reduced in age. I mean, healing is actually a real problem in this elderly population, right? So they're not only having less capacity to heal, they have more areas where they would actually have to, you know, heal. And, and that's a problem, right? So, they, you know, it, whereas in the younger people, it's very coordinated and it's, it's one piece of bone that has been set up such that it's the one that should fail. So you're not in a very dangerous area typically, um, and uh, you can heal easily, right? And so that's very important uh, to actually understand in terms of 
just you know the mechanics actually also of, of bone so this is all the biomechanics of bone uh, and before we go into the mechanobiology of bone let's say right when we look a little bit more about these kinds of forces do actually to the cells that are underlying this so we don't see any cells here um, and you can see like uh, the good thing about also imaging in that sense and image processing is can you can identify these elements and you can see oh gosh you know like when you look at very thin trabeculae they all get bottled a lot and they're going to fail. Um, but also what's very dangerous is actually such plates. They are actually very strong, but with age, you get these fenestrations. And uh, in this uh, hole here, as you can see, you know, that's of course a stress razor. And, um, you know, very small changes of density, you know, in terms of just to take away a little piece of bone, but it's now much more likely to actually uh, fail at that point. And you can see that actually in these images, uh, this has now been a slightly different technology. Before it was just a desktop micro CT. This is a polychromatic uh, source. And here you will see actually bones that um, uh, have been measured with synchrotron uh, radiation. And there, what you can do is, of course, tune the energy to a very you know, small uh, range. And so you have something called monochromatic beams. And, and they allow you much better to uh, look at uh, small details uh, in, in that sense, because you don't have uh, something called beam hardening and uh, scattering on these uh, surfaces so much. And, and you can see then these cracks very nicely. So basically, it's the same that the other picture that I showed you before would actually look exactly the same. You get these cracks. And it's very important, you know, these uh, structures actually, right? So that you have uh, convex structures, uh, like in, the, in, in here, right? This will be a convex structure. And then you have concave structures, like this surface, or the whole is a concave structure. And all of these uh, cracks actually emanating from these concave structures, right? So you you know if you if you're opening up um, concave structures, then there's very high likelihood that you actually you know get a, a crack there. And it's like notching you know materials, right? To make a notch, and that's a concave structure. And then if you basically pull on it, then of course it's going to just nicely develop a crack along the line of the notch. You have many notches actually in such structures, and it's important to see that. So that's all human bone in, in verte vertebra, and it's just a normal process. It has nothing to do with osteoporosis, but of course the amount of bone is important, how much overload you have, how much failure you have, how much cracking is going on that overall maybe leads to failure, or it will be something that it will be healed locally without that actually you ever noticing right, that it does this. So, uh, I, I'm switching a little bit just to show you also what has been going on in the ultrastructural level. Unfortunately, we don't have any human data actually to look at these kinds of details. Uh, this is now from a mouse femur, uh, an experiment, the same kind of experiment ex that we, what we do. And what you can see here uh, is actually all the ostracides that will be embedded into the mineralized tissue in a piece of cortical. And uh, you, you actually see also all the vascular channels that are going through uh, the cortical bone. And in green, uh, in the background, you can, you can actually see crack. And so I can, of course, digitally, it's nice. I can just reduce and take away all the cells because right now I'm not so interested in it. The cells do not play in the first degree a big role in where these cracks are formed. But you can see again, you know, that on these uh, concave structures. I mean, they, they are, of course, convex uh, shown here, but in terms of the matrix, these are blood vessels typically or other types of void structures. Um, they will be in the bone and concave structure, and you have emanation basically of these crack weight planes. So, right, cracks are not linear cracks, or oftentimes you talk about linear cracks, but of course, they are three dimensional objects and they call the weight plane. So, um, and you can see they're always gonna emanate actually from these structures. They, they're not just like somewhere in the, in the bone, they, they're actually coming from these uh, porosities, let's put it this way. So very important porosities in bone that are actually also happening. So both cortical bone gets more porous with it, you know, and a lot of potential actually to develop cracks, right? So, and then if you can't repair them so well, then of course, if you have too many of these cracks, you're gonna fail. Um, and just to show you also that the cells are actually quite important. So this is now just a two-dimensional section going through, you know, you can see the mineralization patterns and you can see actually a crack emanating from this concave structure, like this one, this is the crack. I and mean, if you follow that now again, you can see that the cracks actually don't, just don't go arbitrarily through the structure. They're actually connecting through this ostracytic lacuna. So the ostracites are there. They, uh, they actually get exposed a lot to, you know, 
mechanical forces. They're actually triggering to some extent, not the initial cracking, but how cracks actually are moving forward, right? So this is a very important part that uh, they, 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 they give you the path. And, and this is for the crack, but then you have to understand that, of course, when you have loading that doesn't form a crack, well, still the mechanical loads will actually go through the ostacitic lacuna and they will be amplified there. And, and so then they are extremely well positioned to feel what's going on, right? In terms of the mechanical environment in both. So these cells have really that ability because they're always exposed. And what they really don't want actually to happen is that the, a crack will emanate because once a crack is going through the ostacites, they die. So, so this is something, you know, they, they cannot withstand that. So it's very bad for them, right? Because their microenvironment is hurt and they actually gonna die. And that will send signals, you know, these apoptotic cells will send out signals. So also for the osteoplast and to come in to actually remount this area. So this is a little bit the mechanism how this uh, works. And I, again, um, I'm not so much going into these kinds of things later, but I thought it's a good introduction and can see like how well controlled this system is and how much is going on. But you know, can, it's always a good thing to have remodeling. You want remodeling, otherwise you don't have renewal. And, and, uh, but also very dangerous, of course, because in that time, a lot of things can happen. So can we stop osteoporosis? Can we prevent fractures? So maybe for the people that know, of course, yes, uh, we can do a lot. Um, we have drugs available that uh, would reduce the incidence of fractures by 50% uh, typically. And, uh, you know, they've been around for some 20 years uh, or so. And uh, um, unfortunately, um, they're not highly used in the elderly population. They have rare side effects um, that people are very afraid of. And, um, you know, and they start using it. So um, uh, it's a problem, you know. So is there alternatives to that, right? So can we, can we, you know, we know we can actually stop or prevent a lot of fractures happening and they're devastating. Again, people can die from it. Nevertheless, they have afraid uh, of the side effects, which I totally understand. And so one way, of course, of also counteracting this uh, would be using mechanical uh, forces, right? So we know since Wolf's Law, um, Julius Wolf, uh, who stipulated already in 1882 that bone forms and gets stronger when it's loaded, um, and is bone or not, uh, or only lowly loaded, it will resort and get weaker, right? So it's German anatomist and surgeon, and, and he has looked at that. And then it, you also also a connection to ETH at the time. So uh, there, there is Kuhlman actually that uh, was looking at um, basically um, trains and how they actually loaded and how, how you actually have, you know, the bone adapting actually to these uh, load scenarios. So these are drawings uh, from uh, Kuhlman in that sense. I mean, like based on the drawings of Kuhlman uh, that Julius Wolf used to explain that, you know, in a femur, for example, say very nicely how you have these stress trajectories that are, in, you know, really nicely can be observed uh, in how they actually uh, generate that microstructure, right? So you have this kind of adaptation. And one thing that, um, yeah, you see the bone is adapting, but one thing that uh, hasn't been so clear and that is known though, of course, is that if you, load your bone more, for example, through rigorous exercise, and we'll get to that what that means, um, you actually will have more bone form. So you have an anabolic drug actually, right? So mechanics in the right way, in a safe way as well, so that you don't overload the bone. I've just told you, right, that you can crack at tracks. But if you are like in a safe window, um, you actually um, can increase the bone mass or can help in not decreasing the bone mass. One of the reasons why you have less bone also in the elderly is because you're less active at that time uh, overall and you don't have a heavy impact loading actually, for example, right? That's something that the elderly people do not jump from one meter height you know, anymore. And of course, in the young people, you still get that, right? And the jogging is different and all that kind of thing. So this this is an important part. So that's the space. And so, so examples of Wolf's Law, and I have to show this guy. So, in, you know, again, coming back, 39 years old, um, and uh, still playing, you know, quite well tennis. Um, I know there is a, um, a Spanish equivalent to that, um, a little younger, but uh, also uh, astounding. Uh, but what you will see, you know, is that uh, both them, you know, uh, 
uh, better replace with, with one arm um, and rough replace uh, both arms, right? So uh, and have, we'll have the left, but they, they will have their uh, surf arm actually being about 30% more bone density, right? So here, because of the surf is the highest impact uh, load they get during the, during the play, their surf arm actually is uh, exactly what uh, is making the difference. So not the, you know, the overall playing of the uh, tennis, but it's serving. And, and you have these very high frequency components, very high impact at, at that point. So tennis players have, uh, it's a nice, you know, you can also look at baseball pitchers, for example, you know, if they, if they pitch, throw the ball, this is a high impact and a pretty heavy load they have to throw. And they do that, you know, so often, um, so they get actually loading, you know, uh, through training, uh, effect, and they will have drastically in, in, uh, uh, increased actually uh, bone marks, and that's been shown and published uh, nicely. So, uh, what about these guys? Bodybuilders, for example, um, they do not have bone problems. I think this guy has all kinds of problems, but uh, probably not um, problems with his bones, uh, because you, if you have a lot of muscle mass. You constantly, you know, need to act on the bone. So there is also a relatively high frequency component of muscles that are pulling all the time on you, even when you sleep. Um, there is actually, you know, going like some 39 hertz firing of the muscles. And, and that is actually believed to also be an osteogenic signal, uh, not only for the muscle, but bone muscle interfaces are very important. So the muscle actually and the bone go hand in hand to some extent uh, with their development. Um, on the other side, you might have astronauts. Um, this is here, um, a, a crew um, on the uh, ISS. And um, you can see, of course, there uh, that, uh, you know, they lose bone, right? So because of not having uh, enough impact, actually. Um, so they can do muscle training, they do, right? They do the resistance training, but that's not good enough, actually. And uh, they, they lose about, you know, one to two percent bone per month when they are in uh, a uh, weightless uh, environment um, in that sense or like uh, if they're in space so this is a problem and and of course it's also interesting to see what kind of forces do actually need um, to help them so it is not just the muscle but it's also that you need impact actually right so muscle force alone is not good enough you, you need somehow this this uh, impact, uh, high loads, and, and that's very difficult to generate actually in, in space. Um, so one thing that people have found that could be actually overcoming some of that is a uh, vibration therapy. And uh, this has uh, been now postulated for a few decades in that sense, uh, ever since also a, a kind of a nice long paper by Rubin in nature uh, that shows very nicely, you know, that if you do kind of high frequency and a relatively low impact, uh, you still could have an effect. And it's been based on animal studies most of the time. And still people trying to actually bring that into the realm of humans, which is not so simple because it looks like, well, high frequency alone doesn't help, as it's just showing you in the muscle, you need this impact. And, and that's really the, the biggest problem in trying to find out how much impact you need. And I'll get back to that actually just in a second. And um, uh, so scientific studies have shown that bone is very susceptible to mechanical vibrations. And uh, this vibration therapy is currently investigated in, in a number of labs as a potential therapy against osteoporosis. Um, and uh, so vibration, of course, is sound and um, in, in classical physical sense. And uh, the question you have to ask yourself is then are, are bones therefore able to hear? You know, so do they have a hearing? Can they hear sound? And how can we actually hear sound? And that's something that we're very interested. And we're interested actually eventually to know on the molecular level of what's going on. Not necessarily, you know, so much work has been explored in how maybe the mechanics is transducted and so how the cells will hear. Like in the hearing, you have your hair cells, right? And um, that is not hair, I don't have any, but in your in my hearing, I still have some hair cells there. And I can still hear. And, and they are very, you know, tiny structures. Uh, you have similar kinds of structures in these osteocytes that, uh, called cilia. Uh, and also they can actually, you know, maybe be involved in that hearing, but I will not show you any of this mechanotransduction mechanism. There's a number of things that are happening actually when mechanics goes on, direct and indirect on the cells. And uh, I'm more interested in what's going on in the machinery in the cell and how actually we, you know, can investigate that. 
So um, what we do we know so far, maintenance and adaptation of bone morphology results from an orchestrated remodeling process. And this is uh, what you can see here now. This is now on the, I haven't shown you pictures on this really, really high resolution uh, level. These are the green uh, parts of ossocytic uh, cavities. So the, the ossocytes would sit in those green cavities as the, the cell body, the nucleus is inside here, and they're connecting to each other over these uh, dendritic processes called canaliquary. And, and you know, uh, they, they, this is now the imprint in the bone, so it's not the cell, um, but the cell actually has the dendrites that are inside here and really are connecting each other, they communicate to each other. So this looks very much, you know, this is the one of, you know, about a third of the connections you would have in your brain throughout your bone system. So the bone system is a nervous system, if you want to, right, that has a lot of connections, can really talk to each other, all of these cells. It's most of on bone cell. It's about 60,000 cells per cubic millimeter, so a huge number, and they all connected to each other. Right. And these connections also change with age and they also change with disease. Um, and I don't want to talk about it. But what's important is that these structures, they are about 100 to 200 nanometers in. You know. So it's not so easy to measure those. So even with optical light, you can detect them, but you cannot quantify them uh, because right, the optical light limits are, are roughly 200 nanometers. And so if you have 200 nanometers in structure, you can detect it if it's separated enough to another, but you cannot measure, for example, the thickness or something like that. And then you need the uh, techniques like uh, focused ion beam combined with scanning electron microscopy. That's uh, such a technique here to actually reconstruct this. So this is kind of locally uh, coordinated and the, the mechanics by these ostracides, as I said, right? they are in a prime position to feel it. And uh, they, of course, use biochemical signals um, uh, to do that. Um, and, um, but also ion transfers, for example, calcium signaling and things like that are very important. But uh, you know, so maybe you know, it's, it's chemical signals, that's what in, in, in general, we would say that it's a biochemical signal as well. And, um, and this will in result in increased or decreased bone formation or resorption activities. And so to better understand bone rotation, we therefore have to understand how ostracides sense and process actually uh, mechanical loading within your local microenvironment. So here are some models that we then use in the mouse. So, I, you know, again, I'm switching. This is all human data, you know, except for the one that I showed you already, also sized previously. And uh, now I'm kind of switching to, to finding models, right? Because you want to investigate that very difficult to do that directly in, in humans. Um, because we, we cannot observe the humans as easily as we know, and especially what is more difficult in the human is to experiment with them, right? So uh, this is difficult. They don't, don't have the, all the same background, they have very huge genetic variety. And uh, here, when you use mouse, you can actually use mouse models that have identical twins all the time, right? So you can have a population of mouse uh, that has certain genetic makeup, makeup, and you compare it to another one, or you can at least uh, interfere, you know, with whatever they uh, do and uh, make really design an intervention. And then you know that they all have the same kind of background, the very similar structure, and, you know, and something can change. So it's easier to see significant differences. And, uh, you know, it's expected that on the genomic level, there's a high similarity with the, between the mouse human genome and, and uh, the mouse genome and the human genome. So we can also use a beautiful imaging technology like these uh, Viva CT40 or 80 that we're using right now. They have about 10 micron resolution in vivo. Uh, measurement times at the time were about 20 minutes, but now we can bring that uh, back to, you know, about 10 minutes or something like that and in larger stacks. Um, and uh, you can measure actually a, a whole bone. And so this is just showing something, a typical model for osteoporosis would be you uh, take out the ovaries of a female mouse and that would uh, lead to kind of the same effect as in menopause, so there's estrogen withdrawal. And what happens is that, you know, you start losing bone you know, over 12 weeks right, quite dramatically. So this is normal shed mouse, still a little bit of growth going on in terms of the this is called bone volume to tissue volume. So this is basically at the bone um, density in volumetric uh, measurements in percent. And you can see you, you're losing about 30% bone in 12 weeks, right, in that. And that's what you see actually in this structure here. So this will be in a caudal vertebra. I'm going to show you the model just in a, in a second as well. Uh, so in the tail, in the tailbone of a mouse. And um, you can see this, this is the internal structure. And you can see what you can see very nicely how from this beginning, 
bone is thinning out and actually gets disconnected, right? And then actually all resorbed in the center. So, um, you know, this is what happens in osteoporotic case. Um, and you can, this can, because you can do multiple in vivo measurements, you can actually do uh, registration of these images and then calculate, for example, you know, how much resorption in blue you have versus formation. You can see if you lose a lot of bone internal in your back bone, you'll form some compensating effects on the outside. Again, this I show you later, and we'll talk about the cortical bone more. This is mechanics actually driving this, right? Because you're getting weaker and weaker, and you need more bone on the outside to compensate for the loss in the inside. If you have a sham animal, this is more or less homeostatic. So you have about as much blue as you have orange. And so this is just idling and then actually, you know, just you know replacing, right? But you can see in the in the time frame, this will be typically two weeks apart, you know, and how much you have to change. And I think here it was four weeks, but typically we analyze that in two weeks. And so this will be actually even quantify that. You know, this is something you couldn't do before. You could do histology and you can look at formation rates, for example, with double labels. Uh, but um, here uh, you, you can't actually do that. So our computational approach is that we have allow us to actually calculate how much blue, how much orange we have. And you can see that, for example, in this you know, normal mice that the Shanna, you have formation resorption is pretty much the same, especially at the end. So they're in the age where we have really no bone formed, no bone uh, uh, net uh, uh, gain, net loss, they're just, uh, you know, remodeling about 0.5 cubic millimeters um, per cubic millimeter of bone uh, per day. So this is what they do, and they will continue doing that for some time, and with age, they also would decrease them, of course. Um, but um, when you do the orectomy, you have this shooting out of the formation rate, uh, resorption rate, I'm sorry, and then it's stabilizing and actually coming even down. And the reason for that is that you can see that nothing happens. If you take estrogen away from this system, you get this response, but actually nothing happens on the formation side, except for when now potentially you have a very critical state, right? So this is maybe gonna fail soon. And somehow now the cells and also starts get really alerted, right? Oh, there's gonna be cracks coming. And so this signal out, right? Oh, please, you know, form some bone there because otherwise we don't have cracks coming. And so this is what happens then. So formation rate starts kicking in, it's gradually growing, right? Until it's kind of meeting again. What happens though, and that is really true also in humans, is now this remodeling rate is higher than it was. So you more, you know, if there's something in, is an imbalance there, you are faster losing or gaining bone at that line. And unfortunately, in older age, you're actually more prone to lose. So if you are then maybe doing less exercise later on, so this will be about you know simulating the age of 50, 55 in women when they start menopause. And then, you know, this is a, a, a rapid loss um, and, and, and it will be about three to five years. And, and then it's actually stopped, you know, right, for a long, long time. But then at the very old age, when you become less mobile, you know, and you're remodeling quite fast, well, you know, you're losing bone again, you know, and that's very dangerous. That's where you actually then uh, break your bones. Okay, so this is just to give you a little bit models of bones. And one of the models that interests us more is like, how can we do a measure bone application? So again, we take this, uh, for example, black six mouse, which is a stand mouse, is really like a, a gold standard, let's say, line uh, that has been investigated a lot. Uh, what we do is actually we push pins in uh, there. Um, and we do that, uh, of course, when they uh, alive, they get anesthetized and then it's like an implant, right? So they get implants uh, pushed into their vertebra, uh, this one and this one. And then uh, we have actually access uh, with our imaging to the, uh, in, the mouse bone in the middle of it. And then uh, what we do is like we load this, right? And then what we uh, do in this uh, study, actually, what I'll show you is that we have a 10 hertz load in the gene. I'll show you actually that this is very good just in a second. Uh, when we do that for 3,000 cycles, which is five minutes of uh, load. We do it three times a week and for four weeks. And, and what, will, what happens, right? And you can see now uh, just the same kind of you know, image that I showed you before. And, and it kind of starts you know, um, here. And now we see with time, you actually get more bone, it's getting thickening rather than the loss that you had before because of this loading. So, so I look at the data. This is the data now from this original studies long time ago when we started exploring this in 2011, option 2011. And um, you, you can see that we, we gained about 20% bone 
with an exercise, vibrational therapy, three times a week, five minutes. So five minutes of exercise, three times a week, was creating 20% more bulk. That's pretty spectacular. And uh, you know, this is compatible to the best drugs we have on the market, actually, that would also increase anabolic drugs like the paraffin hormone or sclerostin antibodies or something like that. So mechanics alone can actually do that. Of course, this is a very small bone. How to get five minutes to all bones in your body uh, that are important, that's a different story. And that we haven't been able to transfer that, of course, to humans, but it's just to show the potential. And just a quick few visualizations of that. So this is the first week, you know, right? Baseline, you know, bone that is uh, formed, uh, tubercular bone. It has uh, a lot of these kind of plate-like structures. Has also some demonstrations, as you could see here uh, at that age. And the second week, you know, you, you get already some connecting structures again. It's just like getting 45, and you see these holes getting smaller as well with the third week and the fourth week. And the fifth week, I eat food or so, right? So you have now fortified this structure. And uh, overall, you see that the bone actually has been, you know, growing here in all the orange. That's where you had bone formation. But interesting, although you gain 20% of bone overall in the time, you still have resorption going on. And why is that? And this is, of course, very easy to explain if you take mechanics, right? Because you say like, okay, this bone has been, you know, crying for help. The alpha side here said, well, you know, there's a lot of extra forces. You need to take care of it. You need to form bone here. But when you actually fortify this area, then you actually unload another local area, right? Because now the most of the forces, stress and strains will go actually through this part because it's this, you know, stronger uh, part. And, and then actually you unload this side. And that would be the signal actually to say, well, it should be resorbing here. We have too much bone in this area. And so this is happening. Overall, you have a positive balance, but you have loss. And so that basically you can say that the gain was 30%, but you also lost 10% in the same time, right? So this is the remodeling. It's just a positive envelope. And I think this is nicely shown also in this picture. You can see how also computational tools can really be helpful. This is a finite element analysis of a whole vertebra. So it's quite big. So we use typically supercomputers or started doing that. Now one can do it actually on any kind of multi-core system. Pretty powerful systems, maybe not your laptop, but um, uh, you know, it can be done uh, in very efficient ways of doing uh, you know, find out the nuts. And what you're seeing here is that inside the structure is that you actually get areas that are loaded highly and in red and uh, strained highly. And in blue, you have areas that are uh, very lowly loaded. So the nice thing about the tractor structure, you, you don't, you know, you need really to know the local status, right? Because it, it's not, you know, you cannot say, oh, I use compression of, on the whole thing. And, and now you actually get, you know, everything, um, you know, is everything known? No, you need to know, you know, where the bone locally is formed, um, and sorry, loaded highly and where it's loaded lowly. And so Wolf's Law would say, where you have the high strains, you should form bone, and where you have the low strains, you should actually resort bone. And that's what I want to quickly show you here in one nice graph. Uh, you can see here, we have that, the nice thing is we have this mechanical map, and we also have the map over time where bone is formed and bone is resorbed. And you can see here that very nicely that in this area, initially, we had very high loads or strains. Sorry, this is a strain energy density actually that's shown here. So combination of strain and stress. Um, and, um, and, and then you have actually bone formation happening. And in areas where you had underloading, you can actually see how the bone is getting resorbed, right? So this shows somehow the theory is correct. And, and we can actually quantify that. I you know, don't want to go into detail because I show something later actually related to that. When you have you know, uh, loading, then the differences in SEDs uh, to the initial you know, overall SED, uh, you can see it's it's about you know 20% higher in the formation area. So that's significantly different from the areas that are quiescent. So they don't get formation or resorption on the surface. And actually then 40% higher uh, in absolute numbers uh, to the resorption area. So we have a separation. So you can show statistically actually that what, what Wolf said on the global level is actually true locally. And that's the first time, you know, almost 10 years ago that we were able 
to show this is an important paper that shows this. this is also true locally. You know, people have shown this at Bonadet, but they haven't shown that it's really a local for the strain that is important, right? So that it's adapting to that, and the cells are susceptible to feeling somehow this. So this was then a good model for us, right? And to look at it. And this is not just in the loading case, it's actually the same. Um, and it's actually also significantly different in the control animals, right? It's just maybe less pronounced, but it's not something completely different. So this seems to be a universal law. We also tested lots of different drugs and it's always happening, right? That it actually is mechan on the mechanical control. So mechanical control in healthy, diseased, treated bone is always there and is always acting. We haven't seen cases where things fall apart mechanically in terms of their control. So that's a very important take home message. But what about the frequency that we use, right? So these are, you know, 10 hertz is something that is super physiological, uh, but, um, you know, it's very difficult for you to do 10 hertz uh, movement, right? So if you're typing on your keyboard, you can do something like uh, 180, you know, probably characters in a, in, a, in a minute. And so this would be three per second, so three hertz. Um, 10 hertz is, is quite a bit more than that. So super physiological, you're probably not experiencing that uh, easily. So uh, we use this and we want to know though, you know, when you go to more physiological range, um, you know, how, how, what is actually happening. So we had five hertz as well, we have two hertz. Uh, we have a static um, cause, so you put the load on it, but you do not cycle. So zero hertz basically. And uh, you have a sham that is not loaded at all. It's put into the system, the loading system. It's anesthetized the animal, but, but it's not. This is very important in the animal size, of course. And then you're looking at the trabecular region and the cortical region, and uh, you actually do formation desorption maps, and you find the fine element analysis to see what the control is right in, in that. And if you do that, um, just want to quickly start these things here. Uh, you can see that for the static and for the shen uh, animals, uh, you can see that you're actually losing a little bit of bone. And, and what you can see also is that you get disconnections uh, very early on. And so you're actually resorbing very thin structures. That's why the trabecular thickness is still, although the bone is actually lost, slightly increasing because you preferentially lose thin structures when you do that. So, you know, in that time, uh, in that age of the animals with the whole model, you actually have almost no change, right? But if at all, you lost actually a little bone. So now uh, you can see that this is a negative remodeling, right? So there is, if you, you know, distract bone formation rate uh, versus minus bone resorption rate, you know, you get this, you know, percent per day, about a half percent day loss right in that structure and you can also see that, that there is more you know kind of violet structures you know here that then these are orange uh, structures that are so negative remodeling if i now move to 10 hertz and also two and five you can see that with increasing frequency you get a response so two hertz already is anabolic five hertz is you know kind of there, you know, it's like almost the same as 10 Hertz. I can also see in thickness changes, it's actually the same. So somehow, you know, there seems to be a dose response with this frequency. And uh, when you look at that at the end, you have a positive remodeling. You can see that, you know, you start loading, uh, you know, here. Um, and then after one week, you already have uh, an effect actually, right? So for net formation, and it actually got to be peaking at two weeks. And then bone starts adapting actually. And you can see that in the end at four weeks, you're still doing actually the loading, but the bone has adapted already. So there is no change anymore, right? But you need to maintain it. If you withdraw that uh, exercise, it will actually be going back, right? Because now you're underloading the bone for what it has been built for. And so then of course the signal should be that you actually having resorption. So that's something that is important to know. Initial response at two weeks peaks, and then it goes down. But when you plot this um, and this net uh, formation for all the animals in the groups, about 10, 10 animals per group, um, you know, seven to 10 or something like that. And you can see that this is, you know, quite varying their response, but the averages uh, actually form uh, some kind of curve. And if you fit this, you actually have an experiment, uh, a logarithmic law that fit this uh, very nicely, this data, you know, so 
0.74 R squared, um, and uh, showing you actually that you know frequency is an important factor, and that's exactly what we were able to show. So if you do static or actually you know even you know um, sham animals, they they actually have uh, roughly you know almost zero hertz, right? In that sense, and and uh, you actually see that the threshold uh, where you reverse from catabolic to anabolic is about 0.36. Hertz. So this is something that you probably experience in high loads every day. Very, you know, you need to maintain right the bone. You need about that kind of frequency. So you know, not a lot actually, right? But um, if you go higher, things that you do that have high frequency, for example, a serve in tennis, because if you hit it, you have an extremely high frequency response uh, in the bone, um, and then uh, you actually see that you know it, it's saturating though. Right? So if I go to 100 hertz, that's going to be the same results because it's logarithmic. Um, and 5 and 10 is hardly any different, but 10 is still better. right? So if you can do it with 10, it's five minutes of exercise. This is faster, right? So this is only two and a half minutes of exercise, and you still get this very good result. So actually, you know, it's favorable in that sense. And you can do it also at multiple bones in the same time. So you, know, you can kind of use this actually as something to guide you uh, through exercise in the mouse. Uh, we have to look at that, how this looks in humans. Nobody has been able to do that, but you can see they have a catabolic window and an anabolic window here. 10 hertz is really what we want. And just to show you again, that if you look at, you know, remodeling maps and SD or gradient SD, so SD gradient, uh, which is even a little bit better signal, uh, you can see again how this really beautifully matches. So you can see these areas have been resorbed, these areas have been formed, and you can see, especially in the staying gradient, actually, which we think is a very important gradient, some very important uh, signals, not just as, you know, absolute uh, SED, but actually the changes that you have uh, in, in terms of gradients and, you know, matching beautifully with these maps. Um, then you can calculate the conditional prob probability. These are probability curves for resorption, formation, and quiescence, and you can see that you know as you go to higher SED or SED gradients, you know your probability of actually having formation just increases. But it is of course a large scatter and something that is an uncertainty analysis is required actually there, right? So it's not fully fully deterministic, uh, but it's really something that probabilistically you can show that formation happens here mostly and resorption absent happens here in a very small window, right? So with very you know very highly uh, and so you have to be careful on the resorption side that if you don't have enough SED, very quickly you lose bone. If you want to get more bone actually formed, you need to really work very hard to actually get to these levels of making sure that you're bone. And that's why it's been problematic. So exercise might be really most helpful in when you actually, you know, trying to prevent losing bone, right? Because here you don't need much to actually go from a catabolic state to you know, a maintenance, right? But to go here, that needs high impact. And the forces we put on these mouse, nice, is half the breaking strength of the ball, right? So that's quite a bit. If you think about a human femur breaks 5,000 Newtons, so 500 kilos, you need to put on an elderly person 250 kilos. That's a lot. I, I wouldn't dare to do that, right? So this is a one of the problems. Okay, let's see how I'm standing. I, I think I need to kind of uh, go quickly just to show you a concept. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I want to show you uh, how we talk about economics quickly, right? As a concept. So we want to know all of these things. So we have the strain distribution, we have the cells, blast class, and ostracides. They creating a, a genomic, transcriptomic, proteomic information, of course, that we can analyze. And this uh, creates coordinated remodeling and then it leads to bone adaptation. I show this differently. We have a technique that we call local in vivo environment, live imaging, where we have in vivo micro CTs. We do a second scan, we register these scans. Uh, we have a bone remodeling map. We can calculate the strain energy density or other types of mechanical forces uh, in this structure. Now, now we, let's do a histology section at the end. So this is a very important part. So at the end point, we have histology sections. These sections can then be analyzed. You can see here all the ostracides that are in this small little region here. And what we do is like you go in these sections and actually cut out individual uh, ostracides using laser capture microdissection. 
and that's something shown here. So this is a laser that you will see in blue shining up and there underneath will be the cell. We go around three times and you can see how this is nicely cutting into the tissue. So the first time, and, and then you use a laser pulse actually at the end to actually kick this piece out in an Eppendorf tube. So now you have the cell, all the information in there, and you can individually actually, you know, analyze each cell. So we can do hundreds of cells and we can look at these cells. And what we can do, because we have spatial information, it's something called spatial genomics. Uh, you, you can actually know this cell has been associated with a quiescent area. This one has been associated with a forming area, a resorbing area. And also we know this has been, you know, middle loaded. This has been highly loaded, uh, lowly loaded and so forth, right? So we have a lot of information about the status of the cells in the microenvironment. Have there been forming areas? Have there been uh, high loads, right? Because we can do biochemical analysis of each one of the cells, we can do some pure PCR, or we can do RNA sequencing even, right? Uh, Chipsic or whatever we use, and uh, you know can get gene expression actually in single loss sites. And it's just to show you quickly that you know in, in control animals, these are three genes that are important uh, for you know uh, signaling loss sites. Uh, Sclerost sauce is a Coding for sclerostin is an important uh, protein that uh, is involved in, in bone. So if it's if it's uh, reduced, then you have bone formation. Uh, it's ubiquitously expressed otherwise. OPG uh, is one and rank ligand. And you can see that uh, it's uh, very interesting to see, for example, the rank ligand who is signaling actually osteoclasts to do bone resorption. Uh, you can see how this is actually reduced dramatically, right? When you actually are in highly loaded areas, there is no rank ligand expression actually in these parts. If you go and look at the loaded animals, you can see that sclerostin uh, SOS is reduced in all of them. So you have basically down regulation of SOS, uh, but you actually also have, um, you know, uh, rank ligand being now reduced in these intermediately loaded areas. So this is a very, very important part. And uh, this is, uh, you know, something that uh, we can see the mechanisms. And, and I, I could spend more time on, on looking at other types of uh, regulation of that and how we can analyze optical images. And also, you know, like seeing that uh, the osteocytes that are labeled for sclerostin, for example, for proteomics uh, analysis, and, you know, and how they associate with forming and resorbing surfaces. Um, and there's difference in that, but also that it's regulated. The apposition rate, for example, is really responsive actually for the sclerosis positive oxide. But um, I, I do not have uh, much time uh, to do that. And looking at the time, I'm, I'm already at the end, I guess, of this part. So we have this discussion afterwards of the way I understood it. And uh, I, I do want to leave out the part about uh, regeneration. Uh, where we also have, of course, uh, these kinds of uh, things, but maybe it's just as a teaser. Um, let me quickly go through this. Sorry about that. So when we when we look at uh, bone formation and uh, in the regeneration, I just also and I think it's important for you. Just want to show you how we can actually also have some of these. Uh, formation and regeneration events uh, in in silico prediction models. So you can see very nicely here how we have osteoblast, osteoclast, lining cells, pre osteoclast, uh, and how they form a piece of regenerated bone. And there's even vasculature in, involved in that by using a multi-physics, uh, multi-agent model, actually, in that sense. And you know, it's, it's kind of beautiful to see what you can actually simulate. So this is really simulating over weeks in uh, minute updates um, uh, of what's happening on the cellular uh, level. And uh, just to show you also some of the effects that you can simulate with that, this is now a uh, difference between polarized and unpolarized cells. And just to show you quickly also what's happening here uh, between polarized and unpolarized versus also in vivo part, which is, of course, difficult to uh, synchronize that exactly. Just to show you also a little bit the effects, uh, you can see that we can form nicely these calluses here. Uh, we have a uh, resorption going on at the end and uh, resembling, uh, to some extent, this structure. Of course, we still need to work on getting the right dimensions as well, but it's very important, I think, that we can do uh, these kinds of simulations. Okay, so in conclusion, 
Uh, what I've been able to show you today, hopefully, is that bones have very good hearing. Time lapse in vivo imaging allows longitudinal quantification of bone adaptation regeneration. It's very important to use in vivo data. And this mechanics allows you the coupling of biochemical information with the mechanical and remodeling microenvironment of the sites and other cells, and informing cell-based uh, in silico models then of form remodeling to predict realistic outcomes for bone adaptation and regeneration. Uh, in the future, hopefully, this will facilitate a better understanding of uh, biochemical signaling uh, in load induced bone adaptation regeneration. This is a nice image here uh, showing a human bone again, and also how you can identify actually with these high resolution, but one micron resolution, uh, also acidic lacuna, actually. And we want to push this in human also in the simulation slide. So at the end, I need to thank uh, my funding agencies, and the, the team is a little bit older, and we haven't been able to meet. And to make a nice uh, picture, so it will just be a Zoom meeting picture, but I'll use a little older one because most of the people that have been contributing to what I showed today actually are on this, uh, in this frame. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm open for uh, the discussion. Okay, Ralph, <clears throat> thank you very much for this, for this great talk. Uh, so now we are taking questions. So I don't know if we have questions in the chat. No, no one has a hand raised so far. Okay, so I might start. Uh, ah, yes, there is one. Okay, I, I have to be a good chair. I will give the word to Ben before. <laughs> Morning, sir. <laughs> uh, thanks, Rob, for this very pr excellent presentation. I'm very impressed um, I'm really uh, from this work. Do you also have a look, because I was fascinated when you showed the data that 10 hertz is really causing increase of bone volume. And is it only good, this 10 hertz? Do you also look at cell viability? Is it the cause because you kill uh, osteoclasts inside? Is it only good or is it could be also bad? For instance, for the, if you look at intervertebral disc and we also did experiments on 10 hertz, we can see that just the metabolism is kind of, uh, oh, um, I can overheated and, and we, we kill the cells, for instance, in this organ. Can you maybe comment on that? Yeah, I mean, we just had actually, uh, in collaboration with uh, Karin's group, uh, Elena Cambria has actually just published a paper where she analyzed actually also the disks, right? And so actually, it, it, you know, the, the, like on the molecular level, you can find differences and, and uh, going in the direction that it might be detrimental, but there wasn't any signs of, you know, Defect actually in the in in the uh, and of course you will have that if you increase time. So I, I'm not sure what the window is. What is a very bad frequency for you know uh, uh, a uh, intervertebral disc? But uh, it's clear that if you like say lorry drivers, uh, people that would uh, be on the uh, on the you know hammer and digging in the street right for excessive hours of vibration. Uh, is very bad for the discs. And I'm not sure it's good for the bone either, right? But this is a very tricky part uh, that we know in the animals, we do not see detrimental effects with this therapy of five minutes, three times a week, yeah. right? But it's already indicating there might be also in the cartilage, you know, there could be a problem in the future. And so you probably need to rest periods to basically get inflammation totally away, you know, so, and that's all things that we know actually, right? So it's also from training regimes. I mean, you, you cannot just always train, you need rest periods so that the body can actually just get all the information out of the body. And this might be also the case. We don't allow actually these animals to really have rest, right? It's just not enough time. Uh, but uh, it, there, there is really a, a therapeutic uh, window. And, and this uh, question probably is also through a question that I just saw in the chat as well already, that a similar question you with know, OI patients, for example. And uh, yeah, if you already have defects, you know, in, uh, in your cartilage, uh, maybe that's uh, not really a good indicator. Um, it's just that, let's say, if you're interested in osteoporosis, then we know that OA is a counter uh, indication. So it's very rare that uh, OA patients also have osteoporosis. So um, that probably has to do with the sclerotic nature of the bone. So the bone is strong, not good, but you know it doesn't break. Um, and so um, this this might be you know you have less damping, so you get actually better you know force. Uh, and transferred. So we have not looked at that uh, specifically in OE mods, in mods, for example, spontaneous mods, which will be available. Very interesting. 
Um, I'm a bonehead, so uh, we've done some of other work, but not really an expert on what that would do in the cartilage. But it's clear that it would do damage if you would do it all the time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, uh, actually, there, there, there are some questions in the chat, but before, uh, I would like to follow up on that. Um, so in the bone, uh, actually, you have hydroxyapatite, uh, which is ceramic and able to transmit um, high vibrations. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, first uh, the uh, piezoelectric uh, effect of hydroxyapatite at high vibration couldn't wow. have uh, an anabolic effect or whether um, actually the, the, the high vibrations might generate microplaques in the hydroxyapatite, so stimulating then uh, the rank L osteoproteserine uh, system of bone remodeling. I, I don't know if, if the, the time scale would match. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good point. Again, as I said, we have looked very little in canotransduction in that sense, whatever it will be, where it's biochemical, but where it's electric. Um, so I, I can only say from what I know in the literature, of course, we have uh, piezoelectric effects in bone that's been known since this. 70s, 80s, or something like that, with, uh, with uh, important papers. But actually, people have not been able to show that this would be the driving factor. I still believe there's a huge role for that. Um, and of course, there's a great interest in, in piezoelectricity because, of course, you can bring in electrical fields rather than you know, that the people doing that and, and, and actually have very mixed results. Right? Uh, this, is, this is the problem. So there is nothing clear data. I think the uh, more the, the, the parts that probably are much more established is, uh, you know, um, stretching of you know, integrins um, and uh, that will, will lead uh, to, you know, internal pathways. And most of what we see here in the formation side is, on, is probably going to be on, the, on wind signaling. Um, and uh, on the resorption side, uh, which is, seems to be much more tightly controlled, actually, to be honest, if you much more interesting, actually, to intervene with this right and OPG kind of ratio. Um, and, and how this is coming about, I mean, mechanically, um, I really don't know, actually. I mean, there is, not, there is no mechanical element uh, clearly indicated in the literature. Um, it could be ion channel um, and, uh, of course, uh, um, things like piezo one is now a big topic, right? So uh, some great stuff coming out of just Snedeker's lab here, for example, um, in the tendon. So um, yeah, it's very highly implicated. Um, so and then that happens in bone too. We just did a study where we look at piezo one and it's also in bone. So and ion channels is is my guess, um, and and of course that would also uh, show by calcium signaling that maybe is a very important. Uh, indicator, right, that the people have shown that. But we actually, this is just hearsay. I really not having our own data. I mean, we look at some of these uh, proteins in the end, but we haven't done specific uh, studies to address that because of the heterogeneity. And, and, uh, and uh, so, we, yeah, but thanks for the question. It's very important. <clears throat> and then and maybe I will make a last comment, but and leave, leave it open. Uh, I think that in uh, highly hydrated cartilaginous tissues such as uh, intervertebral disc, where you have a lot of damping, uh, maybe when you reach a certain high frequency, actually, the cells stop seeing the fluctuation, but see like a static load, a, a constant static load, oh. and it might happen. Uh, so we can see we can see that macro consolidation effects, for example, happen, and, yes. and ignore completely. Um, uh, second scale fluctuations. So you are right, but it will be counterintuitive because if you go higher frequency, you have less damping, right? Because it gets incompressible with more frequency. So your disc, the higher you load it, the more it will be like, you know, very stiff. It will be extremely stiff. So you have direct translation of that, very little. Hmm. Because if you move the water fast, it's incompressible and it gets direct control. So the problem is actually with the low frequency components, they get damped, but the high frequency one, they go right through. That, that, that's how I see it, but you're more expert in soft tissues. But um, this is also what we simulate because we do actually simulate in the FE this effect, right? So, um, and that's what experimental data has shown that actually you need to 
you know, you, you need to make it stiffer actually. The, you know, so that's why we simulate actually the, um, the uh, uh, we don't do a frequency simulation, right? It's like, you can't do that. Uh, the time scale doesn't fit. So what we do is we change the material properties of the, of the disk. And uh, the best results uh, come, you know, to look at gene expression and, 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 and also look at formation resorption is when you pretty much have uh, the same properties as bone. Right? If you go softer, it doesn't happen anymore. So you need to actually have the disc being very stiff and that what high, what high frequency does. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Ralph. Okay, so uh, now I will uh, voice the questions. I'll maybe just uh, give the word, uh, uh, Sarah. Do you want to? Hi, um, sorry, I've got no camera, but hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, I actually had a couple of questions. I was wondering um, when you were talking about using the laser to cut the osteocytes out, how do you know that you can fully capture them? Because surely the um, canicula can extend quite a lot. So I'm not sure how you, um, yes. yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. So, the, you know, I mean, the uh, idea is, of course, that we, we looking, we know from uh, staining um, of the proteins, right, that, for example, SOS will be not detectable in the canalicular system. It's, it's so little. Um, so even though uh, we will not know to which of the cells actually this belongs, as long as we have the cell body inside, we're gonna have 99% of the usable RNA uh, available. If okay. there's a specific things that would be, um, and there will be, you know, what happens in the clinically in terms of mechanotransduction, right? That's something, if you wanted to know that, then we would have to take a totally mm -hmm. different approach, but we cannot do that. So what we're looking is whatever genes are expressed, genes are obviously not expressed in the clinically, mm -hmm. I mean, they are not in the dendrites. They are expressed from the nucleus. And so we know that we have uh, that information available with the RNA that's available. Okay, so as long as you have the nucleus of the cell, then you have... And it's it not solves what you're trying to answer. But you see it, actually, uh, where it is. You see where the osteocyte is. Uh, not because you see the cell, but you see the, the lacuna. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not really nicely shown actually on the black what you see, but when you're sitting in front of the microscope, you can notice where one cell is. And the cells are like maybe 20 microns, something like that, right, in, in dimension, and they're going to be 40 microns away from the next one. So it, it's relatively easy actually to, to think that, fact, especially if you're in a section, because it's actually even further away, right? because three-dimensionally, they may be 40 microns, but two-dimensionally, there's almost like 100 microns between the cells. Um, and so this is not so difficult to actually get the center uh, out. Um, it's more difficult is that uh, the laser, uh, of course, needs energy. And uh, we got a little bit lucky there because uh, our laser was not very powerful and we had to cut three times. But that seems to be much better than modern lasers. They, they actually produce so much heat that you actually degrade all the uh, RNA. So, so the technique is, uh, you know, has problems. And this is also why we go away a little bit from that and trying to use you know, kind of uh, 10, 10x visium type of approaches where, where you can actually get uh, genomic information directly on the tissue rather than to have to cut the gun. That's really interesting. Thanks. And um, the other question I had was, um, you mentioned about in, uh, the cilia on the osteocytes. And I was wondering if you were to include those in your model, would there be, would you know if there'd be like a significant difference in remodeling captured or? We, we cannot include it in the model if we don't have that kind of fidelity in the resolution, right? Because they can't be, I don't know, seven nanometers or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. So, um, and, and it's already difficult to detect them. Um, the problem is a little bit that it makes a lot of sense that Celia can, I mean, they, they can do that. We know that, right? Will they be a major player? People have not been able to show that. I mean, there's, there's been really quite a bit of work uh, maybe 10 years ago. And you know, really making that a big thing because this analogy to the hearing is so great. I mean, and, and actually we see this response of frequency as well uh, as in hearing, right? It's the same kind of law. 
And, uh, but, but people have not been able to demonstrate that well. It might really be because they have good ways of detecting really the cilia and the action of the cilia because it's so small. Mm-hmm. And maybe the t- statistics will not work in your favor, right? So when you measure something on a, on a nanometer scale, you can typically not do millimeter type of uh, you know, analysis. So you have to have that balance. And uh, again, you know, this would be great. Uh, I would have to say we, uh, I, you know, in that sense, uh, stay a little bit away from this very local analysis. We've done that in the past, but we just never got the statistics. You know, what, I showed you a picture of two cells that takes eight hours to actually image. Um, no way you can do uh, 60,000 per cubic millimeter, right? But no way, you know, this, this is 60,000 times eight hours. Um, no way we can uh, uh, get these statistics. So trying to fu- leave this for now. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Thanks for answering my questions. You know, solve this problem, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. So next question is, uh, is from Marta, Marta Branaco. Marta, do you want to ask your questions? Your question uh, hi, yes. Um... Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting and inspiring. Actually, uh, my question was already covered, so I don't have uh, another question. I was also wondering uh, about uh, the, the effect of the vibrations on the cartilage uh, structure. Also, I saw that and uh, I addressed it almost a little bit, right? So I felt the hope that this, but if you had any follow up questions, and, you know, then of course you can do it. But we never did actually work on on a uh, OA in that sense. And um, um, oh, we worked on OA, but not in this model, right? So uh, looking at that, we have just look at uh, structural changes actually in patients. And that's quite interesting, of course, what happens uh, in the bone as well, um, because uh, it, it is really two parts, right? So, but again, the clinical is not necessarily a clinical problem. We probably wouldn't want to put OA patients on a vibrating plate. Um, although that's also to be discussed because what does uh, vibration does, of course, it increases uh, vasculature um, a lot. And um, so uh, this is something we know from the muscle work, which is the most clear effect on the vibration. And of course, uh, we know in a way that could be actually a beneficial part, right? So there's also uh, a problem of diffusion and if a problem of transport and uh, increasing vasculature could be actually be beneficial. So yeah, exactly. yeah. Potential. there is a potential to actually be yeah. actually useful, but people, I guess, shy away because they really don't want to damage more the cartilage, um, even though it might actually help the bone and that would then help the cartilage. So, um, I, I, but I'm not the real expert on, on, on that. So we're exploring a little bit of that, but not really a lot. Okay, thank you. And you're welcome. Okay. Then uh, we have a question uh, from Carlos. Carlos? Do you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I was, it was really interesting for me uh, all that you presented about uh, mechanical loading and remodeling is quite really, 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 really nice. So I was wondering regarding the mechanical load. Uh, if do you think that the buckling might have an effect in trabecular bone remodeling? Well, in terms of, you know, so, okay. When you look at remodeling, we look at um, signals, mechanical signals that do not break the bone. Okay, so we have looked very carefully when we do the loading, there is no micro cracks uh, generated. Means that buckling, you actually, there is no buckling in bone if you do not have micro cracks. So the buckling looks like buckling, but actually they have local failure, right? And you have buckling. So what I showed you, you know, this nice buckling is just on the global level. If you look carefully, you see these cracks like in the picture that I showed up. Right. You would also see that in a small one, you would have cracks. And that's, of course, a very different uh, mechanism. So when you have buckling, then you have a defect and the remodeling is very different. It will target actually this defect because you have epitopic osteocytes, they die, and that's why osteoclasts will come in. So it's a very different type of remodeling that we have not explored. People have done that. They have induced cracks 
And then they can see targeted remodeling resorption to do that in, for example, Mitch Schaffer's group in New York. But we haven't shied away from that because we would like to use it therapeutically. And I think that would be just too much. I mean, like, I, I cannot ever imagine that I say, oh, I have an osteoporotic patient that probably breaks his or her bone or mostly her bone in the near future. I'm not going to induce cracks to heal. That, that's going to be very difficult to sell. So we look for signals that do not create damage in the bone, right? But still are anabolic. And so this is what we have uh, used. But you're absolutely right that, of course, the buckling would be indication of crack, and that would actually lead to resorption because you will have unloading in these areas as well, right? So yeah. as you have a crack, you have no strains anymore. And then and actually even the ones that survive would actually say, please take it away, right? It's like not good. And that gives hope that it's going to be regenerated. So, so this is the, just the, the part is like the more cracks you have, the more chances you have actually to build bone because these micro callus that you form, they're big. And so this allows you to reconnect structures, but nobody dares to touch this because yeah, you might just overall fail your bone and you have a devastating effect, right? And need a hip implant afterwards or whatever. So I think this is just not being explored. But thanks for the question. Thank you very much for your answer. Okay, so <clears throat> no, no, it's time for the break. So normally during the break, actually, we will continue in the room. So Ralph, if you agree to stay with us uh, 15 minutes more for if there are more informal questions or- Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. Actually, 